Hi everyone. I would like to start by saying a, a big thank you to the organizer for this invitation to present a keynote talk. It's really a great honor for me. I've attended my first uh, IL conference about 20 years ago. I think it was in 2000 in Barcelona and I was as an undergrad student and since then I've attended all the following IL conferences and so it's a great pleasure for me to attend today as a keynote speaker and I really want to thank the organizer for being so resourceful and dedicated in organizing the first online IL conference despite the chaos and disruptions created by the pandemic for the last year and a half and I would also like to thank you all for attending and hope that you are all well and safe. So today I'm going to talk about the potential of new sequencing approaches to build on the importance of natural history collection and more specifically uh, lichen collections. So natural history collections aim at housing and preserving physical specimens and their associated data and as such they have many uses. They are repositories for the name-bearing specimens, the types which are the foundation of nomenclature. They house study material for taxonomical research. They are a resource for evolutionary and ecological research where they help documenting historical and modern patterns of biodiversity. And in many cases, they are also used as a resource for education and outreach. So there are many collections around the world and here I just wanted to mention the big five to highlight the sheer number of specimens preserved in collections across the world. And that's first the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History with 146 million specimens, the Natural History Museum in London with 80 million specimens, the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris with 67 million specimens, the Field Museum in Chicago with 40 million specimens and the American Museum of Natural History in New York with 34 million specimens. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of specimens preserved in various collections across the world. And I will just take the opportunity now to introduce the collection I'm working. It's the National Research Collections Australia, which is part of CSIRO, the Australian National Science Agency. It hosts about 15 million specimens, so a bit more modest than any of the big five. It includes a wildlife collection, a fish collection, an insect collection, the national herbarium, a tropical herbarium, a tree seed center and an algal collection. And it's located across three sites, most of the collection being in Canberra, except for the fish and the algal collection that are in Hobart in Tasmania and then the tropical herbarium in Cairns in Queensland. So in Canberra we are currently split across several sites as well, but we are currently planning for a new facility that will bring the wildlife collection, the insect collection and the national herbarium together. And our collection is very industry focused because it sits within a research organization whose main aim is to support industry and government as opposed to be uh, fully involved in education and outreach as many um, museums are, for example. So as I mentioned, the Australian National Herbarium is located in Canberra. It's actually a joint venture between CSIO and the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. It is split in two sites, which luckily are just next to each other, with the Fanerogam Herbarium on the CSR on campus and the Cryptogam Herbarium next door at the Australian National Botanical Gardens. We have a total of 1.2 million specimens, with 900,000 Fanerogams and 300,000 Cryptogams. And among the Cryptogams, we have 115,000 lichen specimens, including 1,600 types. As opposed to other herbaria in Australia, which are state herbaria that focus mostly on the state they belong to, our herbarium has a national focus with collection from across Australia. And we do also have quite a bit of overseas specimens, in particular good collection from Papua New Guinea. Now back to the importance of natural history collections. These last few decades, I see three main advances that have transformed the way we use collections. 
and this is through the development of digital open infrastructures to host biodiversity data. And that's, for example, JBIF, and then in Australia, the Atlas of Living Australia, which means that anyone can at any time access species geospatial data for research. And that was possible thanks to the massive databasing efforts in collections across the world. The second one is the mass digitization effort that have happened in a significant number of collections in the world. For herbaria mostly, but not only, but led by the development of conveyor belt type of imaging technology. And that has led to, the, to large number of digital images of specimens now being accessible for research across the world. And the third one is the development of technologies that allow affordable sequencing for large number of samples. And that has led to genetic data being freely available for large number of species and specimens from databases such as GeneBank or Eyeball or Unite. And now I would like to draw from Australian examples to illustrate the impact that these three advances have made on our societies, environments and industries. And the first example is about the importance of being able to access geospatial and taxonomic data. And it brings us back to the summer of 2019-2020 in Australia, which will be remembered as the Black Summer. After years of droughts and particularly dry and hot conditions, Australia had its worst bushfire season on records, with 8 million hectares of vegetation burnt across the southeast. And the question of the impact of these extensive and very high temperature fires on the native vegetation was often asked, and in particular because these fires were raging across national parks and relatively untouched natural vegetations. And to answer this question in December 2019, while the fire were still burning, my colleague Bob Godfrey and collaborators were able to use the geospatial data hosted in the Atlas of Living Australia to generate species distribution for plants from this region. They then uh, used remote sensing data to generate a fire extent and temperature data layer, which they then overlapped to the inferior species distribution ranges. And what they found was that 816 vascular plant species had more than 50% of their known populations burned. So their results were not only used by government to inform management and recovery strategies, but also published in Nature in 2001. And the second example is about digital images and taxonomic data. Due to its relative geographical isolation, Australia is prone to the impact of invasive species. And one example is the brown marmorated sting bug that came from Southeast Asia and can cause significant damages to Australian agriculture. And the problem for quarantine officer that makes sure that this species is not accidentally imported in the country is that these invasive species can easily be mistaken for harmless native sting bugs. So my colleague Alexander schmidt leboon who had been interested in artificial intelligence-based identification tools, was able to use 10,000 digital images generated as part of our digitization program to train a vision-based software to recognize these species from native species using a phone app. And this app can now be used by non-specialists to identify those sting bugs. And Alexander is now applying those AI-based tools to the identification of seeds on quarantine containments and to invasive plants in the field. So digital images and taxonomic data are also very useful, especially to develop applications for biosecurity purposes. And the third example is about DNA sequence and taxonomic data. Australian owned industry is a relatively big industry with some very high value products such as the Manuka honey. It's a honey produced by European bees from uh, Manuka trees or Leptospermum scoparium. So determining honey provenance is an important process. And my colleagues Francisco Ancinas Viso and Liz Miller 
have developed a pollen metabarcoding approach to identify plant species used by bees to produce honey. And they compare this metabarcoding approach to the classical identification using pollen microscopy. And using 15 honey samples collected from 12 localities across Australia, which corresponded to a geographical area including 8,679 plant species, um, they showed that the metabarcoding approach shown in this graph in green always outperformed the classical pollen uh, microscopy approach, which is shown in the graph in orange. But what was really interesting to me from their study was the status of their reference sequence databases. Out of the 8,679 species, only 27% had ITS2 sequence available in GeneBank, and only 15% had a tRNL sequence available in GeneBank. So to me, that really highlights the fact that in Australia, at least, if we have done good progress with geospatial and image data, we could and should do better with sequence data. And because collections are repositories for specimens, collections should increase their effort to make sequence data available from their specimens. The benefits would be great, not only for research, but also for curation and collection management, and of course conservation, natural resource management, pest and disease control, product provenance and authentications, as uh, previously highlighted. But more importantly, the risk collection could face in the future if sequence data were not more systematically generated is the loss of relevance. Loss of relevance for taxonomy, as more epitypes are selected for specimen doomed too old to obtain sequence data from. Loss of relevance for other research, for industry and government, and potentially then uh, decreased funding. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to generate sequence data from the large number of specimens held in collection across the world in a reasonable time frame? Well, two obvious requirements which are dictated by the sheer numbers of specimens available. It has to be high throughput, something that can be done in the next 10 years, for example, and it has to be affordable. And in addition to the sheer number of specimens, what are the typical challenges for sequencing collection specimens? Well, first, the limited size of the specimens itself. And for example, if you work on mosquitoes, all you have to get DNA from is a thin skinny leg, so it's not easy. And even for larger organisms, destructive sampling policy often rightly restricts the amount of material that can be used for DNA extraction. Then, in comparison to fresh specimens, the quantity of genomic DNA is generally lower in collection specimens. And also, of course, it's more fragmented. But I would argue that with lichens, we, we are quite lucky in some aspects. First, the DNA quality is not that bad. And here I have graphs that plot the specimen age versus DNA fragment size for a group of moths a group of orchids and for a group of lichens. And you can see that in comparison to insects, the quality of the genomic DNA of plants and lichens is not too bad with fragments up to 11,000 base pair long. And in this uh, study, which is uh, still unpublished, um, we were able to compare collection specimens from different organism groups uh, we also found that the uh, quantity of genomic DNA recovered from lichens was quite reasonable. And the other advantage is that the size of the genomes that we are dealing with in lichens, whether it's the fungus or the algae, are rather small in comparison to other organisms. So about 40 megabase for fungi, 60 megabase for algae, in comparison to 500 megabase for insects in average and uh, more than a thousand megabase for orchids. The only additional challenges that we have with lichens are first the high concentration in secondary compounds then can sometimes decrease DNA extraction efficiency or inhibit DNA amplification. 
And then, of course, the high number of microorganisms that inhibit the lichen tabus and lead to the generation of high number of non-target contaminating reads or sequences. With the development of next generation sequencing technologies these last 10 to 15 years, and also their relative affordability, there are different methods that could be used to generate sequence data from lichen herbarium specimens. And choosing one really depends on the amount and type of data you want to generate. Metabarcoding approaches or amplicon sequencing shown on the left could be used to sequence either a single or a couple of markers. They rely on the amplification of the markers of interest and their tagging to allow to pull large numbers of samples into a single sequencing run. And then at the other end, you have the genome skimming approach, where the whole genome gets sequenced at low coverage to allow several samples to be pulled together, with the idea that multi-copy genes would be recovered and of good quality, even in low coverage genomes. And because the data produces larger, a whole genome rather than just a couple of barcodes, the level of multiplexing for genome skimming, so the number of samples per sequencing run, is lower with uh, this approach. So now there is also an intermediate alternative called target capture, where DNA hybridization is used to capture sequence regions of interest, and typically in the number of few hundreds, so that only markers of interest are sequenced as opposed to the whole genome. And this method requires quite an initial time and cost investments with the development and synthesis of baits. But once available, it is quite powerful. And that was demonstrated by the bait sets developed by Kew Garden for flowering plants and now used in many studies. And it is particularly relevant for plants due to their large genomes, which make genome skimming relatively inefficient. So next I will go through some of the pilot study we've done here, testing two of those methods. And the first one is amplicon sequencing and the second one genome skimming. And we did also uh, start looking at target capture as well, but only recently. So uh, I won't be presenting any results on that. And I'm going to start with the metabarcoding approach, which we have tested over the last few years here at the Australian National Herbarium. And I will start by acknowledging the people who have made this work possible, starting with Lan Li, a very dedicated technician who has carried out the lab work, Chris and Judith, who provided creation support for the many specimens we use from our herbarium, and then the many other like analogies who have kindly provided additional specimens for this study. So for this work, we decided to focus on the Fungal Universal Barcode, ITS, and that's because it's quite easy to amplify for most groups. It usually gives enough information to ID at the species level, at least for most groups. There are many reference sequences already available in database. The size of the amplifier region is between 550 and 900 base pair. And it's also typically used for molecular identification of fungi in eDNA studies although often only half of the ITS then either ITS-1 or ITS-2. So there are several sequencing methods that are available for metabarcoding, including the most commonly used one, Illumina sequencing, which is a method that generates short reads of high quality for decent cost. Then PacBio sequencing, which generates long reads of lower to higher quality depending on the length of the sequence fragments, and which is usually associated with a higher price tag than Illumina. And then Nanopore, which is relatively cheap and generates long reads, but these reads have higher sequencing error rates. And I just want to mention two other methods that are interesting for the metabarcoding of lichen herbarium specimens, and that's ion turns, which was used by Kistanich and collaborator in 2019, and loopsec, which is a method that allows to obtain synthetic long reads with short read sequencing technologies such as Illumina. Because our main goal is to generate reference sequences, our requirement were for these to be full length and high quality. And packed by amplicon sequencing was very attractive for that, as each DNA fragment is sequenced entirely multiple times, 
and only the risk coming from one DNA molecule are assembled together, lowering the risk of assembling risks from different species. And that is not the case for Humina sequencing, where the reads are shorter than the target DNA fragment and have to be assembled after sequencing, with the risk of assembling reads from the many different fungal species that inhabit the lichen talus. So we went for pack by amplicon sequencing. So how does it work? The target gene region are amplified using tag primers and then airpin adapters are ligated at each side of the amplicons so that when the DNA polymerase starts replicating the target region, it goes around multiple times to generate long polymerase reads. The number of times the target region is replicated depends on the length of the polymerase read, which often is around 30,000 and 50,000 base pair which for a region like ITS, which is, let's say, a thousand base pair, including the bells, correspond to about 30 to 50 passes. And these 30 to 50 subreads are then assembled into circular consensus sequences, which have been shown to have high accuracy, accuracy similar to the one obtained with uh, Illumina technology. So we have done a first uh, pilot study in 2019 with 96 specimens for which we recover the ITS region on the PacBio RS2 platform and that was quite successful with ITS recover for 88% of the specimens. And what I'm going to present now is a follow-up uh, pilot study where we scale up the sampling. This time we had 384 lichen herbarium specimens mainly selected from four genera, and that was Catillaria, Bruelia, Endocarpon, and Palmotrema. And the specimens collection dates range from 1973 to 2018. And this was our workflow. Material was sampled from specimens and transferred to MP bio tubes with a ceramic bead and garnet. The material was then ground using a Presidis tissueizer and the DNA extracted using a commercial kit, and that was the Invisor plant DNA kit from Stratec. The ITS was then amplified with the ITS-1F and ITS-4 primers, tagged with the N13 sequence, and then amplified again with the N13 primers with uh, UNIS indices. Once each sample uh, were tagged with those unique indices, they were pulled into a single sample and sent to the sequencing provider for library prep and sequencing. And that was done on a SQL1 platform. Then the data was the multiplex and the circular consensus sequences generated using smart tools. And we did an additional polishing step using data tool. So what were the results? If we look at the percentage of samples for which we recover ITS by genera, it was very good for Brelia with 93% of success, a bit less good for Catillaria with only 67%, still very good for Andocarpon with 83%, but then to our surprise quite low for Parmotrema with only 27%. So going back to the literature and also talking to Ruth Del Prado, we realized that the ITS-1F, ITS-4 primer pair is in fact not the best for this group, and that an alternative primer pair, which we are now in the process of trying, seemed to give better results. And if we look at um, uh, the impact of specimen age, excluding the parmotrima, up to 55-year-old specimen, there doesn't seem to be any major decrease in efficiency to recover ITS, uh, at least not for the taxa included in this study. So in summary, we had an average success rate of 86% across our sampling, excluding parmotrima. All ITS sequences generated were full length and high quality, no chimeras were detected, and the cost per sample was 20 US dollars for a batch of 384 samples. But we estimated that it could go down to 13 US dollars per sample if we multiplex more than a thousand samples together. 
So what next? We are resequencing the plate of Parmo Tremor using the alternative primers and we also have applied this method to the molecular barcoding of all microlichens in the ACT as part of a project funded by a Bush Blitz grant. And there are further potentials for using this uh, packed bioamplicon sequencing method. First, there is also the potential for increasing the length of the target region and include part of the SSU or the LSU or almost the full length of the nuclear ribosomal operant, like in this study by Heger et al. Although increasing the size of the target region will decrease the number of passes per amplicon and therefore the sequence accuracy. Another possibility would be to include more than one target region, like in this article by Chen et al, where they use pack bioamplicon sequencing to get DNA sequences from nine different loci, all in the same size range. This way you don't compromise on accuracy, but uh, have to decrease the number of samples you can multiplex in a single sequencing way, so it's a bit less high throughput. But more appealing to me is this study that went for a single barcode, CO1, but a massive sampling with 20,000 specimens of arthropods. They estimated that with a single SQL machine running on working days, with one runner day, it would be possible to sequence 5 million extracts a year. So that's a very attractive prospect, although maybe not entirely realistic. Okay, now I'm going to move to the other approach, genome scanning. And this work has been done as part of a project that was led by my colleague Andreas Svick from the CSR Insect Collection. And I would like to acknowledge people that have made this project possible. <laughs> Particular Bronte Sinclair, who did all the material sampling, Vidushi Patel, who did all the DNA extractions, Jen Nichols, who did the library preps, and Stephen Bent, who did the bioinformatics. And I also want to thank my colleagues Judith and Chris for the creation support. So genome scheming or metagenome scheming, should we say, for lichens have already been applied to lichen specimens and first by Greshek and collaborators on Massalia pustulata and then quite successfully also by Miser and collaborator on Evernia pronastri and Pseudevernia furfuracea, where comparison with culture microbiomes showed that 86 to 90 percent of the gene space was recovered using lichen specimens. Here we were really interested in pushing the level of multiplexing up in order to reduce cost. And the project uh, included not only lichens but also insects and orchids and the main goal was to develop a pipeline that reduced the cost of generating low coverage genomes. The cost reduction was mainly by scaling up the level of multiplexing, as I just mentioned, but also by miniaturization of the library preparations, which are usually quite costly. For the high throughput, the idea was to handle three 84 library preps at a time and then use a commercial ligase-based DNA library kit but miniaturize the volumes to cut up to 93% of the reagent costs. And that was done thanks to a fancy piece of equipment, a liquid acoustic handler that allowed to transfer tiny volumes to and from 384 plates. And it is very accurate, it's fast, it prevents cross-contamination and have the added bonus of not generating plastic tip waste. For the project, the expected output of those low coverage genomes was the nuclear ribosomal operon, which was of uh, greatest interest for uh, the lichens, the mitochondrial genome, which was of greatest interest to my entomologist colleague, and the chloroplast genome, which was of interest to my uh, orchid colleague. For lichens, the taxon sampling was two plates, one with various species of Aetherodermia, collected mostly between 2001 and 2014, and the second plate was various species of and genera within the Ramalinaceae, with specimens collected between 1958 and 2015. 
So the method we use the same DNA extraction method than for the amplicon sequencing approach and recover low to medium concentrations of genomic DNA. In comparison to insects, the DNA was not overly degraded and we therefore had to do a shearing step using Covaris, which added a cost. We then used the miniaturized library preparation protocol that uh, James Nichols has developed and optimized over the last few years at CSRO. And for the sequencing, we use a run of Novasec with 150 base pair and reads. And we multiplex 192 lichen samples onto one cell together with 16 moth samples. We expected an output of 5 million parent reads per lichen genomes, and that corresponded to a 37x coverage. The assembly pipeline used space and generated assemblies, as well as mine context corresponding to the nuclear ribosomal operon, the mitochondrial genome, and the chloroplast genome. So the results have not yet been fully analyzed, but a uh, first look at the nuclear ribosomal context folders show that for lichens, multiple contexts were generated per sample with a length ranging from a few hundreds to a few hundred thousands base pair, that this context corresponded to various organisms, including the lichenized fungus, other fungi, the algae, bacteria, and even insects. Also, at first look, it appears that there were quite a lot of misassemblies with different parts of a context blasting on very different organisms. And I first tried to extract the region that included uh, SSU, ITS, and LSU, but mostly failed because of various issues, including large chunks of non-target DNA inside the operon and large missing parts in the SSU and the LSU. So I have focused first on trying to extract ITS, and that's what I will present next. But first, to give you an idea of the assembly completeness, here are the bus cost scores for the two plates with the samples run by collection dates. So you can see that it was pretty good for Eteodermia, but much more patchy for the Romalinaceae. And this was not too surprising as Eteodermia were in average younger specimens and also larger specimens whereas the Ramalinaceae plate included a lot of small specimens from which little material could be sampled. So how did recovering ITS from these assemblies went for Eteodermia quite well, with ITS recovered for 83% of the samples, for the Ramalinaceae not as well as for Eteodermia, with ITS recovered only for 60% of the samples, but still a decent number. For the Ramalinaceae, the specimens collection dates range from 1958 to 2018, so we were able to get a sense of the impact of specimen age on the recovery of ITS. And you can see a trend with a decreased success as the specimens get older, but with the exception of the younger specimens, which for some reason show the lowest sequencing success rate. So, in summary, based on those preliminary results, with the genome scheming approach, ITS could be recovered for an average of 74% of our samples. However, not all ITS sequences were full length. Some were on partial. We also detected some misassemblies, both at the contig level and also within our ribosomal genes, including ITS, so chimeric sequences. The average coverage was 5x, so less than we initially estimated, and likely due to the high number of non-target organisms per sample. And the cost per uh, genome was of about 45 to 60 US dollar per sample, which is quite good. So what next for the genome scheming approach? We realized that the bioinformatic pipeline, which we were hoping could be applied to all organisms, has its limitation for lichen specimens. So we will need to adapt it to remove non-target reads before assembly and therefore reduce the number of misassemblies. And then we analyze the data and try to mine for more markers, not only ITS. 
Uh, so what I will do next is to discuss the challenges that were highlighted in those two pilot studies and then also share some perspectives about what solution could be applied to those challenges. So these two methods that we tested show encouraging results, although with a bit lower efficiency to recover ITS for the genome scheming approach, as well as at this stage lower data quality and higher price. So but the opportunity to generate a much higher amount of data with the genome scheming approach is still very appealing, so it is definitely still on the table. I mentioned earlier the two main criteria for finding a method to generate data from large number of collection specimens, and these were high throughput and affordable. So how did we do with these two criteria? In terms of throughput, the main remaining bottleneck is material sampling. Sampling from folio species is still manageable, but sampling from small crystal species is extremely time consuming, and the main reason why we didn't include more samples in these pilot studies. For straightforward groups, such as Heterodermia species, we were able to train one of our casual digitizers to do the sampling in parallel with the specimen imaging, and it took only a few hours. But for the more difficult groups, such as the various species and genera within Ramalinaceae, especially the small crystal ones, I did the sampling myself, and that took days and days. So that's really the main bottleneck up. Present. And that's also linked to the current volume of material needed for successful DNA extractions. If this volume could be reduced, then the time spent sampling could also be reduced. And finally, although it is possible to do more steps in 96 or 384 well plates, which we tested early on, we found that the risk of cross-contamination was much higher in plate format so that we went back to tubes for a few steps and that's for example tissue grinding which we do in two milliliter screw cap tubes and also the PCRs for the amplicon method which we do in strip tube with single caps. In terms of affordability the main remaining bottlenecks are material sampling and DNA extractions. As I just mentioned, sampling material takes a lot of time and adds therefore significant cost to the process. Another major cost which we could not reduce at this point was the DNA extractions. So to be more high throughput we use kits, but this came at a price which does add up when processing large number of samples, irrespective to whether you use the plate or the tube format. And for, amplicon, for the Amplicon approach, for example, although it is possible to significantly reduce the cost of library prep and sequencing by multiplexing more samples into a RAM, the cost of DNA extractions and also the cost of PCRs will increase, leading to only relatively small cost savings. Additionally, having to shear the genomic DNA in the genome scheming approach brings a significant cost, so that's a thousand Australian dollar per 96 well plate. And for both methods, the level of multiplexing has to be lower than what can be estimated based on data output due to the high level of uh, non target taxa. So let's have a look at what the cost would be based on those two pilot studies. If we were wanting to sequence ITS for all our type specimens, that's 1,600 of them, it would be 20,000 US dollars with the Amplicon sequencing approach and 72,000 US dollars with the genome scheming approach. Now, if we were wanting to sequence ITS for all Australian species and infra specific taxa, that's about 4,000 of them, it would be 52,000 US dollars with Amplicon sequencing and $180,000 US dollar with genome scheming. And if we were thinking about barcoding all our lichen collection, that's 115,000 specimens, then we would be talking about 1.5 million US dollar with amplicon sequencing and more than 5 million US dollar with genome scheming. 
So we are definitely not there yet. So just to recap the remaining bottlenecks, it's uh, the time required for material sampling, it's the amount of input material needed for a successful DNA extraction, the cost of those DNA extraction, the cost of, shearing, of the shearing step for the genome scheming approach, the risk of cross-contamination, which prevents us to use plates as opposed to individual tubes, and the loss of coverage due to non-target organisms. So what are the possible solutions to those challenges? Well, that might be looking at protocols that work with low or ultra-low input DNA and therefore require only low input material. And that would help speed up the material sampling step, as well as allow sampling from specimens with limited material, including types. So for DNA extractions, uh, we could maybe look at non-filter-based kits. We have tried several other kits, including bit-based ones, but the commercial kit that we were using was always much better than the others. So for the shearing issue, my colleague Andreas is working on a new low-cost shearing method, which I'm hoping will be available in the next year or so. For the risk of cross-contamination, our experience with the acoustic liquid handler was that it does minimize cross-contamination. So we could maybe try to apply that more broadly, not only to, to the library preparation step, but to other steps as well and with higher volumes. So as for the loss of coverage due to non-target organisms, which is especially a problem with the genome scheming approach, a solution might be using target capture instead of whole genome sequencing to restrict the sequencing to target regions and, if possible, target organisms, or at least only fungi. So here at the Australian National Herbarium, we don't have uh, many very old specimens, historical specimens, and for example, for the 1,600 lichen type specimens we have, 92% of these were collected after 1970, and therefore not too old. But this is not the case in many other collections. So looking at generating DNA sequences from historical specimens is also very important. And with Sanger sequencing, ATS has been recovered from a 75-year-old specimen of Aspicilia that was by Sorabi and collaborators, from a 151-year-old specimen of Caloplaca by uh, Rechenko and collaborators, and ITS and other markers were recovered from 100-year-old specimens of Storlema by Benditsky and collaborators. So it is possible, especially now with next generation sequencing short read approaches that work well with highly degraded DNA. And that was demonstrated in the pioneering and all inspiring study by Kistanich et al. that took advantage of uh, iron turn sequencing to test the sequencing success of the mitochondrial small subunit on specimens up to 150 year old. And I'm hoping that more people will start looking at applying NGS uh, technology and perhaps ancient DNA methods to historical lichen specimens. So what will the future entail? Well, talking to other people here in Australia who are looking into generating reference sequences or reference genomes for Australian plants, animals or fungal species. Many think that the solution is to develop one method that fits all and that means all types of organisms and also all types of specimens. And although I can see that it is easier to convince funding agencies with a simple solution, I'm not sure whether it is realistic. And I think that different methods will have to be developed and used for different taxa and also different types of specimens. And for example, providing that we can further decrease costs we could envision using a whole genome sequencing approach for a representative species of all Australian lichen genera, then an amplicon sequencing of one of your markers for all our types in our biome, possibly a target capture approach for all Australian species and infraspecific taxa, 
and if affordable, uh, 90 s amplicon sequencing approach for all specimens in our herbarium. So to conclude, I want to stress that sequencing collection specimens is definitely not a new idea and that many of you are using collection specimens for molecular studies and that's really fantastic. But generating molecular data is often restricted to a person's group of interest and to my knowledge, mass sequencing approaches have not yet been applied to entire lichen collections. And that's what I think we should move towards to. In addition to sequencing specific groups, we should also move towards a more systematic sequencing coverage of our lichen collections. And to do that, just like specimen digitization benefited greatly from the development of mass imaging technology, we would benefit from the development of a mass sequencing pipeline. And most of the technology we need for the various steps of such a pipeline are probably already available. They just need to be put together and tested on lichen herbarium specimens. And I'm sure that there will be many new methods presented here at this conference. I'm really looking forward to see all the presentations and posters and learn more about new approaches to collection-based research. To finish, I want to give a massive thank you to everyone who was involved in those two pilot projects. First, our creation team, Judith Kornoff and Chris Cargill, who help with the pulling out and processing of the hundreds of specimens we use. Also, the many collaborators who have provided interesting specimens and shared taxonomic knowledge over the years, and that's Jack Elix, Pat McCarthy, Ginter Scandrillis, Max Malen Cooper, Claude Roux, Michel Bertrand, Joël Mona, and Andre Arthrodes, and many others. I want to give a massive thank you to our fantastic technician, Lan Lee, who was instrumental in getting the PAC Bio method set up in our lab. And a massive thank you to the team of the Collection Genomic Projects. And that was Andreas Zwick, the project leader and an entomologist here at CSRO. Bonte Sinclair, who did the digitization and material sampling. Vidushi Patel, who tested various DNA extraction methods and did all the extractions for all the insects, orchids, and lichen specimens. James Nichols, who is our acoustic liquid handler expert and who developed the miniaturized library preparation protocol. And Stephen Benn, who did all the bioinformatics for this project, as well as Katarina Naga, my orchid colleague. I would also like to thank all my past colleagues for the help and support over the years, and thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions.